Hello, so this is author James Rousseau, and I'm talking with author DC Alden. I'm coming to y'all today from Tampa, Florida. How are you doing today, DC, and where are you coming to us from? Uh, I'm doing very well, thanks, James, and I'm coming to you from London. London. And that's England, not Ontario. <laughs> so how are things going out there in London? Are you in the bunker now, or are you guys uh, you know, still hanging out in the, the parks and whatnot? Yeah, technically uh, we're locked down, um, but you know we're all getting out and uh, doing some exercise and breaking the quarantine. I see. Yeah, uh, queuing up outside shops. It's just you know. Awful. Very good. But it's all we care about in the UK is when the pubs will open. Yeah, it's just like your books. I mean, I love it. It's, we're just watching your fiction just come to reality right now. Uh, yeah, but you know. Funnily enough, people don't want to read about uh, viruses right now. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, and Facebook has been suppressing some of those uh, uh, ads for virus books right now, too, which is kind of ironic. Really? Oh, yeah. They don't want to spread that uh, stuff around, man. They're like, nope, nope, not happening. Actually, uh, I've had a Facebook ad running for, oh, God, six months, maybe longer. And it's quite a good one, actually. But it's for the Angola deception, which is all about you know the virus and global yeah, depopulation months ago before you had all those yeah problems. absolutely and uh, the amount of abuse i've been getting on facebook from strangers going oh, you're this is inappropriate and you know so that was a good book, by the way. what can you do yeah i liked that book though that was a very good book i read that one i think your first one i read was fortress though that was really or no oh, was okay. well that's yeah that's the second one of the of the series yeah yeah yeah. Uh, invasion was really good. That was my favorite one. I was like, wow, someone wrote a really good invasion book about invading the UK and all the fight and the battle because there are no like European authors who write European war books. It's always some mm -hmm. American typically who does it. I yeah. think Bobby Black, I think, is the only one who uh, writes anything similar uh, in, in the genre at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've got the idea from Tom Clancy because. He wrote Red Storm Rising. And I think, you know, when I read that, I was in the army at the time anyway, in Germany. So it resonated with me. I thought it was a fantastic book. I just loved the scale of it. It was so sweeping. I loved all the different kind of um, storylines. You know, you had pilots, you had tankies, you had infantry, you had politicians. I thought it was just a fantastic book. And I, I always wanted to do something similar. Um, but I just didn't have like a, um, I didn't want to use the Russians cause that'd been done before, obviously with Red Storm Rising and I just wanted to do something different. So I, I created this alternate universe where there was this huge caliphate and, you know, they were weaponed up and, uh, they had the, uh, means and the motivation to take Europe. Of course, historically, the Islamic armies have tried to conquer Europe 29 times. Yep. Um, and so, you know, it kind of felt right to do it, to use them. And it kind of worked. Okay, I got a little bit of uh, abuse for, for that as well. <laughs> I even got a death threat once. Um, however, um, yeah, yeah, people seem to like that book. And, you know, if you take it for what it is and, and just look past the the kind of, politics of it you know people people seem to enjoy it and it's still for me it's still a great seller and that book's been out for over 10 years now yeah so in various forms yeah, so, yeah. When i was in germany when i was still living in germany i probably read that gosh it's probably been six or seven years ago now maybe you know probably really? seven maybe eight. i really liked it though it was really good Thank you. So we want to kind of dive in and get a little bit more information on you as a person and an author because everyone loves to talk about the books and series when they do these interviews, and that's great, and we'll, we, we will do some of that. But uh, one of the things we want to know is where did you grow up, and what was your first job? What did you do when you started uh, joining the workforce? So um, I'm London, born and bred, and I actually, from the, about the age of 10, I knew I wanted to join the forces anyway. I mean, I just devoured war books like there was no tomorrow, even as a kid. Um, my grandfather, great grandfather, they all fought in the Second World War and the First World War. And 
you know, I just felt it was kind of in the blood a bit. So I knew I wanted to join and I was at school and what I wanted to do was like fly helicopters because who doesn't want to fly helicopters? <laughs> and so um, I had to get a load of really good grades and then uh, I didn't get those really good grades, unfortunately. Um, I took another path, which uh, I kick myself for now. But I ended up joining, I, I got a really rubbish job, um, but just to tide me over until, because I'd already signed on to join the army and then I, I went in at 17 into basic training. So, um, and I stayed until I was 24 and left then and went out into the big wide world. I did a few jobs because when you leave the forces, you know, you're always kind of like, what am I going to do now? Yeah. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, and so I, I kind of like, I, I found uh, that that was just as computers were kind of making quite a, an impact in the world, like desktop computing, that kind of stuff, Windows and Macs. And so I got involved in that because I found it, to be honest, I found it pretty easy to, to do. It's quite, I've got quite a logical brain and computing is all about logic. And, and um, so I got involved in that, got a couple of good jobs um, and then basically worked doing IT for, I think about 20 years in the end. And, um, but all the time I was, involved in I did some work on films and stuff and I worked on Band of Brothers uh, which was best job I ever had hands down um, and I used to I used to be on set and I used to look at the scripts and stuff and I, I used to think to myself well I, I you know I, I could probably write something like this and so I started writing scripts and I wrote a script for a short film and my brother read it and he said you know, you should turn that into a book because the short film script was about a prime minister who was trapped beneath ground in London in his bunker and the whole world had gone to hell above him. Mm. And I thought that'd be quite easy to shoot because you just need one room, a bunker, maybe a couple of corridors sure. um, and, you know, get a bit of attention in there. And then my brother said to me, you should turn that into a book. And so I thought, okay, so I kind of expanded the story and that was how Invasion was born. Mm. So from that point on, I didn't really look back. I just kept writing. So what did you do with uh, the Band of Brothers when you worked on that set? What was your job and how did you end up getting involved in that? So I was an extra, basically. Um, and what happened was I was going to work, I was on the train, I was working in Trafalgar Square at the time at the National Gallery. And I was reading a newspaper on the train and this was just after Saving Private Ryan had been out for a couple of years, mm -hmm. which is one of my all time favorite films. And um, so I was reading about that and I was reading about the fact that Tony Blair had reneged on a deal to supply um, British Army forces to act as extras for for Band of Brothers. And so they put the call out to ex-servicemen. So I put my name down for it and didn't expect to get it. And then one day I got a call, can you turn up? First day I filmed, I was dressed as a an American MP and the scene was the docks in New York and all the guys were getting on the boats to take them over to Europe. And I had David Schwimmer shouting in my face for about 10 minutes. Um, and they never even used that scene. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's how I got involved in that. And it was great. That, that job lasted for eight months, wow. 10 episodes. And it was fantastic. One of the best experiences I've ever had. They flew all the veterans out, the ones that were still alive back then, and who were who who were being played in 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 the series. Yeah, and it was just it was just a fantastic experience. No expense spared. One hundred twenty million dollar budget. They built sets that were fantastic. 
I mean, it was the real deal. Uh, you know, it was, yeah, it was just fantastic. So they even brought ex uh, German Wehrmacht and uh, guys over who uh, advised on, on the German side of things. And, you know, yeah, it was just, I mean, yeah, they just went to the nth degree to get it right. And, and I think it worked because everybody loves it. And, and the great thing about it is like, the guys who I work with on there, all the other extras, we are still friends to this day yeah. and we still meet up and um, yeah, it's great. It's really, it's formed a real bond between a lot of us. So yeah, I was lucky. That's, I was lucky to get on that and uh, yeah, a big part of my life actually. So do you think that the being a part of that and the details that you got to see and the scene creations and the, the sets and the props they were using really kind of played into your own realism with your books and how you're able to create the types of scenes that you are because I've read a lot of authors who write military books but there's not a lot of them that get as many of the small details right as you do there's just very few that really hit that same level that we kind of do um, so do you think that a lot of that came from working on that set and being a part of that program uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Anyone who's worked on, on films, when you walk onto a film set and it's been completely um, dressed in a way that's particularly period uh, productions like Band of Brothers, when you walk on there and you're wearing period costume, period weapons, and you just see these streets and buildings and everybody's geared up. You can't help but feel like you're there. Yeah. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd experience, but it really does help you to mentally kind of make the transition. Not so important for us, but certainly important for the actors who had dialogue and wrong camera all the time. You know, for those guys, I'm sure it did help them. And there is that attention to detail. You know, you, you have to, when you're writing books, you have to think about that. I, I, I did a, some work on another film, Edge of Tomorrow with uh, Tom Cruise. And there's a set there where they're in Paris. And I went onto this set, there was no one else around, just me and a friend. And it was inside a department store and it was escalators. This was up at um, Warner Brothers Studio in Leavesden, north of London. And, Basically, they'd built this department store with escalators and shops, and it was all burnt out and flooded, and there was crap everywhere, and but all the signs were there and the hoardings, and that was fantastic. And it was like a proper post-apocalyptic scene. Wow. And it, things like that, things like that, I remember, and, and you know, the water dripping and your voice echoing in these places, and. Yeah, it does help. I think it does help. The, for me, I mean, I've got quite an active imagination anyway. So I kind of, if I've got peace and quiet and I'm writing, you know, I mean, like yourself, you know as well as I do, once you get into it, you get into it. And you can hear all the sounds and you can smell the smells and you can hear those people talking and you're just banging away at the keys, getting it all down. And, um, yeah, I think as writers, you know, you need to have a great imagination. But yeah, outside um, influences certainly do help. So when you were in the military, why did you why did you only do one enlistment? Why did you not choose to stay in and make it a career or, or spend more time in the military? Because it sounds like you enjoyed your time. I did, yeah, I did, yeah. Um, yeah, I had a couple of run-ins um, and a, a couple of... Uh, just agreement shall we say so um and at the time you know that this was back in late 80s and there wasn't much going on as far as deployments were concerned i think bosnia was just kicking off then but you know that was a limited engagement for the british army by the time gulf war one came around um i was a reservist then and I applied to be called up, uh, but they were just inundated and they took, because what happens in the British Army, when there's a call out, they will take the people who have just left over the people who have been out of it for a few years. So 
still... and they were inundated with um, with volunteers. So, and then of course, uh, you know, the rest is history. By that time, you know, you, you're older, you're a little bit wiser, and um, you think, well, do I really want to get my head shot off for like two hundred pound <laughs> a week? No. Yeah. Um, and of course, those wars were political as well. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so. It, yeah, it would have been nice for a career, but I think who knows where your life takes you, you know. You make a decision to do something and you turn one corner, your life could go one way, you turn another corner, it could go another way, you know. It's, yeah. it's a good film actually called Sliding Doors, a, a kind of British uh, romantic type film. Very good, Gwyneth Paltrow's in it. And it's all about her life and what would have happened if she'd have made a different decision at a different point and yeah and it's kind of like that so you know I, I look at guys who have been in the army for 20 odd years have had a great career deployments all over the world yeah you know ch chest full of medals and it's great and you know but you know that just uh my my life took a different path so i don't regret it you know so yeah and it's always fun to you know it, you're young you want to serve in in the military and in a war like that because that's what you trained to do and you, you mm. want to feel part of that excitement of being something bigger than yourself piece of history like that but uh you know what's never really talked about is the after effects of it though either you know that stuff's not the glamorous stuff that's not the stuff that's talked about how you know these guys go off to war but the war never really leaves it never really ends it just continues on it just you know, follows you back home for a very long time, whether it's with uh, in the, in the headspace with PTSD or whether it's you know the physical ailments. You know, I, I have a lot of friends who have served in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan is a lot different than Iraq because it's very mountainous, and so a lot of these guys are just they're physically broke. You know, they're late twenties to mid thirties, and they're just their bodies are just done. Um, you know, from carrying, you know, 120, 130 pounds worth of gear up and down these mountains for day in, day out for, you know, one, two, three, four tours like that. It's just, mm. your body's just not made for that kind of uh, rigor like that. And, uh, you know, here they are in their mid thirties, you know, their bodies are done. I mean, they, they feel like they're 80 years old and you know, they've got 30, 40 years of their life left. And, you mm. know, it's, it's kind of, I feel for those guys, you know, we had a, ours is a different war in Iraq, but, you know, it's, it was certainly different. So you look back on you're like you're glad you served, but at the same point you're like, man, it's kind of like that movie, The Matrix, you know, and they gave you the blue pill and the red pill. I was like, man, I wish uh, maybe I should have taken the other pill. <laughs> the Although I have to say, if I had my time over again, I, I would join up again. That would be the first thing I, I did. Probably would do that too, but at the same point, sometimes I wonder if it was really worth it because, you know. Physically, I'm pretty broke at this point. You know, I'm going to be 42 tomorrow, and it's, uh, you know, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm just physically busted. It just, it, it kind of sucks to be, you know, in uh, daily pain and kind of stuck like that at such a young age. Because you know, I've got a seven-month-old, I've got a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old, and you know, you're kind of, you're, you're a little limited in some of the things you can do because of, you know, you just physical ailments like that but sure you know that's some of the challenges you gotta you know it, it's tough because you want to say you'll volunteer to still go back but then you're also like man what would life have been like if you had uh, gotten so beat up <laughs> absolutely yeah i mean as i say you know who knows what life's going to throw at you and which way it's you know it's going to turn so so you wrote invasion when you got done with invasion yeah. What did you decide to do after that? How did you go? How did you continue your, your writing career? And what did you do? So, Activation was so a what happened? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I got so ripped off on that book when I first brought it out because this was before you could do Create Space and, and that. And I ended up getting talked into self publishing with this company whose name I won't mention, but they're still around actually. And I ended up spending 22 grand getting a thousand paperbacks done. Stupid, stupid. Um, but you know, kind of you get talked into these things and like all authors, you know, you think, oh, I'm just one book away from like 
skyrocketing, you know. Yeah. But I did it anyway, and um, weirdly enough, I sold them all, uh, which was great. Um, and a publisher, sorry, a, an agent got in touch with me, and he said, um, I can see you're getting a lot of um, uh, attention on that book. And, you know, would you like to sign? Well, if anyone knows anything about the literary world, it's harder to get an agent than it is to get a publishing deal. And one doesn't go without the other, particularly here in the UK, you know, because um, publishing is quite elitist in Britain. Um, it's quite difficult to break into if, if, you, if you're not from that world, not from that background. Um, so I signed on with this guy he was a lovely guy actually he's still around he's he's one of britain's um foremost literary agents and he then said to me okay here's the deal um you're gonna have to rewrite that book yeah but you're gonna have to make it more political uh less dull down the military stuff completely and kind of make it more of a thriller so yep. i did that yeah and um that ended up being the horse at the gates uh, which was at the time that was my second book um, and so I spent because I was working full-time at the time so I spent like two years writing that and getting it ready and prepping it and I sent the manuscript to him and within a day he said um, well, actually the market's changed now so we won't be moving forward um, so that was two <laughs> years wasted uh, but that, that's quite a good book, actually. Um, I, that's one of I, I'm really proud of that book because it's because I I was basically writing to spec. So they'd said to me, "Okay, we don't want that book. This is what we're looking for." And without any thought, I kind of jumped straight into it, and I managed to to pull it out of the fire. So I think I did a really good job with it, even though I say so myself. But um, so yeah, so then I lost that agent, and then, of course, by this time Amazon was starting to uh, to warm up, and Create Space was around, and coming out. A lot of people were saying, you know, well, okay, you can publish your own books, do your own marketing, choose your own covers, because obviously, if you sign, if you get a publishing deal, all of that is out of your hands. Yep, they take care of it all. Yeah. Yeah, and you get. A fraction of of for example like a, a 7.99 paperback here some people who have got big publishing deals or publishing deals they're only getting you know 50p a, a book you know a lot of cases less you know we're not talking about jk rowling here. i mean she can bank her own numbers but you know if you're average person unknown writer you know they're not even giving advances out anymore so you know, so I, I decided to go down the Amazon route and um, I'm glad I did because Amazon has been our saviour, really. Whether you love Amazon or not, and I know there's a lot of people who don't like Amazon for what they represent, the fact that they don't pay taxes and that kind of thing. As far as I'm concerned, as an indie writer, I love Amazon, you know. Yeah. It's opened so. up a new opportunity that none of us would have essentially had access to. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely, yeah, they're, they're fantastic. So, yeah, without them, where would we be? Yeah. So, in the effort of trying to get to know more of our authors, what, like, you live in London, so what's your favorite pub to go to? What is some of your favorite, what's your favorite drink? And Take your pick. Your favorite foods. Right, okay, favorite pubs. Uh, I'm where I live in. There's loads of good pubs. Yeah. There's so many good pubs and restaurants. You know, um, it's difficult to choose. So tonight, today's Friday, normally we'd all meet up and pub of our choice and, you know, have a really good night. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is what's killing the English. Well, sorry, the Brits at the moment is the fact that no one can go to the pub. Because... <laughs> You know, our, our culture is very pub oriented, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, favourite foods. Actually, I'm not much of a foodie. I kind of like, I will eat whatever I get out of the cupboard, as long as it's pretty healthy, you know. I'm not like, 
chowing down on jars of peanut butter or anything like that. But I, yeah, I'll just eat anything. So I'm not, I'm not, I mean, Kate, my girlfriend, she's a great cook. Um, yeah, I don't really need to do much. You know, she takes care of all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not really fussed about what, it. What kind of books do you like to read? As an author, we all read books ourselves. So what are, do you, do you read in your own genre? Do you bounce in and out of your genre to other genres? What types of books do you, you like to read? You know, it's a good question, actually, because um, I've, I've found I used to devour books. I would read three, four books a month easily until I started doing this kind of full time, which was like two and a half years ago. So I've found since then, maybe like yourself, that I don't really have a great deal of time to read for pleasure. I'm reading books on marketing. If I'm not reading books on marketing, I'm watching podcasts on, yeah. on, the, pub, on the indie publishing business and or you're doing courses or you're crunching your numbers or you're doing spreadsheets. Or, you know, there just doesn't seem to be any time in the day to read a book. So I normally read in bed. So I'll grab the Kindle not always in my genre though I, at the moment i'm reading stephen king the outsider um just because i love the way stephen king writes and he, the way he paints characters i think is great so economical you know just it's just little things um and as far as uh, other fictions concerned you know i'll read sci-fi but it's got to be good sci-fi. I'm not really big on kind of like space opera sci-fi. Yeah. Um, I know you're doing military sci-fi yeah. at the moment, and I've been following your Facebook story about you know the crafts and and, and the names of planets and stuff like that, yeah. which is all good stuff. I've 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 read a couple of those military sci-fi ones, which is quite good because it gives us. There's only so many conflicts we can write about. Okay. I'm taking a break for a little while. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Which is why I did the, the UFO crash book, because I just wanted to do something completely different and also something set in the 60s before we had all the technology that we enjoy today. Yeah. So um, it was interesting to do that, and I enjoyed doing that. But I think that, um, yeah, you can only do so much military thrillers. I mean, I look at your books and I think, where is he going to go to next? Oh, you know, he's, had, he's, he's had a punch up on every country on the planet. What's next? You know, I got a couple um, I haven't explored yet, but we're I yeah. got to do this sci fi series first and then I'm going to start yeah. finding those. Yeah. There's another good three, three series. It's only going to be a three book series, but it's a, it's a really good one that's going to be coming up. So let me ask you a question. So, how far down the road are you with that at the moment? Well, with the sci-fi one, I've got books one and two already done. I'm about a third of the way done with book three. So my goal was to get those three done, that I was going to take a short pause and I was going to go and write this next three book series on this other military conflict. And then when that one was done, then I would go back and do another three more on the, the sci-fi one. And my goal right. is probably to alternate back and forth between them. So I'll do three sci-fi, three military, three sci-fi, then three military. And we'll just kind of alternate back and forth like that. That way it gives me a little bit of a break and a bit of a fresh perspective. Allows me to, um, you know, build out both audiences, you know, not lose either of them really. Uh, and we write relatively quick. I mean, we publish a book every four, every three months, but I write a book every two months basically. So, you know, if I could ever get any like alone time of a dedicated office and just quiet, I probably could get that down to six weeks. Um, but, you know, you make do with what you can. I'm looking at doing, yeah. um, you know, maybe a co-authoring uh, partnership with another um, one of my beta readers. Um, he's got two books out. Well, the second book comes out in April. Um, he's a helicopter pilot from Vietnam and then, you know, served in the Gulf War as well. And we're looking at doing a, an alternate history of the Gulf War because um, he was a battalion commander at the 101st Airborne over there. And so he's got all the maps. He's got a lot of the inside information and data and, 
you know, a bunch of other, uh, you know, guys he's still in touch with. And so we're looking at doing um, an alternate, you know, history of that war. And I think that could be a fun series to do as well. So he's got to get two more books. Well, he's got to get his next books done before we can start that project together, which is fine right. it's time because he's probably, by the time he gets done with that and he's ready, I'll probably have four or five more books done, which is good because it gives me that break to, to, to work on it with him. But that'll be a fun one when we get that done too. Because that's, again, that's never been done before either. Nobody's written an alternate history to the, to the Persian Gulf War. So it'll be the first of its kind when it finally comes out. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds interesting. I'd like to know which way it's gonna go. Well, we're going to have, he's going to write largely the American perspective and stuff. Um, right. I'm going to write the, the Iraqi version of it. So I'm going to do the Iraqi, the, the Iraq version uh, perspective. It won't be many characters on my side. It won't be a lot of, won't be a lot of scenes on my end. I mean, the reality is he's probably going to do more about, he'll probably do about 70% of the writing on it because he was there. He's got all the experience with it and knows that stuff better than I do. Um, what I'm going to come in with is some of how the Iraqis could have done things had they done it slightly different, how things would have shaken out had the Soviets, because they were still around at the time, had they provided um, certain key pieces of equipment and technology prior to the conflict. It certainly would have changed the dynamics of the war. So it'll be, it'll be kind of fun to integrate some of that, you know, alternate fantasy aspect of it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. It'd be kind of cool. So we'll see. So we're stuck in this quarantine. When this thing finally lifts, what is the first thing you're going to go do when you are paroled from your home? Three guesses. The pub, the pub, and the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's really I'm funny. I'm not an alcoholic or anything. Let me get that straight. So, but yeah. About three months ago, there was a marine amphibious um, group that pulled into port in um, Iceland. And, you know, 6,000 Marines pulled in overnight, you know, Marines and sailors. And in the span of two days, they drank the entire country out of alcohol. I thought that was really funny. That it was a matter of 6,000 or so. Where was that? Iceland. Ah. Uh. Just, that must have cost them a fortune. That's not cheap, that place. They just drank them right out. I think it took them like two or three days, drank them right out. So, I mean, there was no more beer in the whole country. Um, so, it's just kind of funny. I see that happening in Britain within the first five days of you guys being released because I suspect that breweries aren't essential personnel. And uh, so, they'll be cranking out beer to try to keep up with the demand. And uh, you guys will all be just, you know, three sheets to the wind for a couple of weeks. Absolutely, we will. Yeah. So don't come a knocking. Don't come a knocking. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. It's really kind of fun. So, are you guys allowed to order takeout? Can you have like food delivered? Yeah. I mean, how's oh, that? Oh yeah, work? yeah. They leave, they leave it on your doorstep, and that's it. Yeah, um, that's with us too. So yeah, all those all those kind of places are open. You know, you just see like scooters going left and right all over town. You need to get a job um, with that man. Earn some extra side hustle. No, thanks. But I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've been cycling around town, uh, around London, and it's been fantastic because obviously there's no traffic. <laughs> there's no people. And it's almost post-apocalyptic. Well, that's what right Mayor Park has been trying to do. He's been trying to eliminate all the cars from London so there's no vehicle traffic. He got his wish. Well, you can't do that because nobody would get anything delivered, you know. But I, what I have noticed is the roadworks that are taking place. I mean, they're just doing roadworks every day. Yeah, and apparently they're rolling out 5G as well. Apparently there's all these texts rolling out 5G as quick, quick as they can while the lockdown's on. And well, see, what they did is they used hot... all these Chinese workers to put in all this new Huawei 5G for you guys. And apparently the moment they switch it on, all our brains are going to fry. That's what I heard. <laughs> who knows? Yeah. That's another conspiracy theory. All the birds so are who, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's been, for me, I mean, I like to cycle. So that's been kind of interesting because, you know, you can't cycle around London normally without taking your life in your hands. But 
yeah, it's been it's been uh, it's been interesting just seeing the city just so empty. Yeah, which I'm sure is the same all over the world. But you know. Yeah. Now, did you go to the Mark Dawson, um, his little conference he had there before the... Do you know what? I think he owes me money because I'm pretty sure I paid for that, but never went. So that's kind of my fault, isn't it? Yeah. That would be your um, fault. Say again? That would be your fault. Yeah, that would be my fault. There. Yeah, exactly. I have to fly uh, <laughs> I was actually... There was a reason why I couldn't go, and I can't remember what it is now. But... Um, no, I didn't go, but I know, I know a couple of guys who went. Steve Moore, another author, who you may have heard of. You know Steve, right? Yeah. Um, oh, actually, yeah, you do know Steve, because you and I did meet Steve at the um, London Book Fair, not last year, year before. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's a good guy. He went, he said it was great. He said the party afterwards was great on the boat. So a good time was had by all, I think. Um, so yeah, and I finally got to hear your uh, your interview with um, James Black. Yeah, go figure. We recorded that at the SBF. You were there when they did it, and then they lost it for like. Yeah. A year. I was like, "What's up with yeah. that?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. No. But, oh well, that happens. I'll I'll try to get out there next year for the event. I'm hoping to. We'll kind of see how things play out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, do I'm not sure. The, I'm not sure. For me, I'm not sure the book fair is is that essential for me to go to anyway. It's not at all. I'll go to the SPF it's event, meet up with, hang out with other friends, and and, and see people. And then uh, my yeah. wife and I, we want to try and do this without the kids. And then what we'll do is we'll spend a few days in London, just touring around, and we'll go up to Scotland, spend a few days up there, and then we'll jump over to Ireland and see, mm. if, you know, spend a few days there, and then we'll fly back home. Right. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. No, yeah, not bad. About it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Pop round to Dawson's Mansion on the way. Oh yeah, over in Salisbury. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know if he's inviting you know guests over to his place or not. Maybe he is. I don't know. Actually, he does this really good thing for authors, whereby he does a kind of one-on-one. -on -one, yeah. And he only picks like a dozen authors, but they you need to be pretty. You sales wise, you need to be pretty kind of midlist um, and be generating a lot of money. You know, you, you you'd qualify. We don't um, care. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. So so basically, he, he kind of does a one on one with you and covers all yeah. aspects, but at a, a much higher level than than yeah. um, than normal. So the Dawson's got the AM. He's got the Facebook stuff down cold, and I don't. I'll be honest. Facebook, I suck at Facebook. Now AMS, I'm crushing it on AMS. So he's paying. He does a, the, the Amazon's white glove service. Man, you know, God bless me. You could do. If you got the money to burn, man. Good on you for doing that. And that works if you got a big, big backlist like he does. But dude, there's no way in hell I am paying Amazon forty thousand dollars up front with no guarantee on sales because I spend my own money. I'll spend. $2,500, $3,000 a month on AMS ads, and I'll net fifteen to, to 20000 on my own. And there's no way in hell I'm paying Amazon $40,000 up front for a chance at uh, maybe making it back when I can spend, you know, $3,000 and net $20,000 up front, you know, on my own. You know, it's just, I don't know what they're, you would think they would have a better ROI on their own system like that but that's that's ridiculous i mean i i wake i so, way better than they do so that's the white glove program that's their white glove program it's twenty thousand dollars a month minimum but it's a two-month minimum commitment so you have to cough up right. essentially forty thousand dollars up front and then they market they they push your your series for you so word on the street is the vast majority of what they're pushing actually is lock screens, which I think is the worst of the bunch to push. Um, and it's just, you know, you get a uh, return on this return on sale the, that they push out. And most people try to hit between 50 and 70 cents. Now, it sounds like you're actually losing money. And technically, if you look at it from a one book standpoint, you're losing your shirt. Now, the only way you're really making money, this is where, like, you know, where Mark does make money on this, is when you've got, you know, 14, 15, 16 books in a series, and you've got a read through that's above 50%, then you can legitimately make some good money on this kind of a deal like that. But if you have less than, you know, five or six or, or, or 10 books, 
I mean, I don't know why you would pay that kind of money to have them market it when if you really know what you're doing on EMS yourself, there's no reason why you really could be making you know, between a five to nine to one ROI on your own ads. Um, you know, I haven't put this out yet, but I'm in the process of uh, working on my own um, author marketing service company. I actually have the AMS domain that I bought um, and we're going to be essentially offering a competing service to Amazon's white glove service that they do. Uh, well, we'll run your Amazon ads. Uh, yeah, I've been testing it with some authors. I got one of my test subjects. We've we've spent eighteen hundred dollars on AMS ads to, to net them eighty four hundred dollars in sales in two months. So wow, it works. Uh, I need to test it on four more guinea pigs to have my five, and then on my own, of course. Uh, but once we can prove that and we've got a, a system in place to make it uh, scalable, then we'll be opening that up to other authors and, and being able to do that. So we're, we're working on that. I think I'm probably two months away from having that operational with my other partner and being able to do that. Um, but I'm hopeful to get that going because it's a needed service for authors. Uh, everyone struggles with AMS. It's a pain in the ass. I just happen to be somewhat decent at it. But um, you know, we want to get that up and running for people and have them offer offer them an alternative because not everyone can afford Amazon's $40,000 upfront fee to get good AMS service. Um, and I want to provide a discount to that that's just as good or better. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, listen, you can burn through money on marketing. Right yep. now, for me, Facebook ads are working 10 times better than AMS ads. See, I wish, man, I wish um, I was better at Facebook. I just, I have tried and tried and tried. I am, so before Cambridge Analytica scandal, I was really good at Facebook. But what I did is I actually used their type of data and I created an ad set that targeted people I do not want to see my book. So I threw, I went the reverse direction. I said, I don't care about who I want to see my book. Like everyone wants to target the right audience. I didn't care about that. I wanted to work down and, and identify exactly who I do not want to see my book. That was much easier to figure out. When I figured that out, I had a very, very effective ad. And those ads were rocking it for me. But then the Cambridge Analytica came out, they took away um, a whole slew of targeting functions on, on Facebook, you know, exclusions. Yeah. Actually was exclusion. I remember, I was yeah. People mm. based on political beliefs, based on this, this, and this, and this. Mm. And that was a rock star for me. But when they took it away from yeah. me, Facebook became worthless in that regard. So I, I have yet to All figure right. it out, to be honest with you. So I'm not going to lie and say I'm really no, you, I'm not. Let, let me give you a tip. Watch Mark Dawson's advanced Facebook module. No, I have. I just can't seem to find the right have audience. Have you? Really? Because I'll tell you what, I, I watched it. But I mean, I have, I've gone through it a couple of years ago. I haven't gone through it in the last six months, but maybe I need to spend a little more time on going back through it recently. But, um, you know, I've yeah. been crushing with AMS. AMS, unfortunately, sucks up all my time. If I have any marketing time, it's 100% drilling down on the, uh, the keywords and, and, and really finding the audience set on AMS. Because with Facebook, I got to take someone who's on Facebook for whatever reason and get them to cross over to uh, a website or to Amazon and then convince them to buy something. On Amazon, they're already there to buy something. So I've already cut out a big chunk of those steps. Um, and Amazon's got just this massive platform. So if you know how to leverage it right, it's just, it's, it's, it's bigger than Facebook. You know, you're just so yeah. many people already on there to buy a book. Hmm. But also it's about exposure. Yep. Yep. It's all about so, you know, it's a great way of exposing yourself as a writer to to yeah. people who would never normally hear of you. Yeah. And maybe not even, you know, look on Amazon for their books or, or you know. Yeah. So for me, I mean, I'm running that one ad I was telling you about earlier. And, you know, I'm getting hundreds of shares and I'm getting hundreds of downloads of, of my sample chapters from Book Funnel. It's just, yeah, just it's just working, you know. Nice. But AMS for me, not so much. Well, I I to sing up the party, man. I'll, I'll use you as one of my guinea pigs. Okay, use me as one of your guinea pigs because I will, we'll, we'll have a chat about it offline, but 
I can tell you, there's no way I can go wrong with my method. And yet, my sales are not nearly as good as, as the other side. So, uh, yeah, we'll chat about that afterwards. We'll flip, and I, when we go offline, we'll flip. You do, you, you do my Facebook ads and I'll do your AMS ads. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. All right, well, we've been chatting for a little while, so I probably need to cut this off. Yeah, sure. Getting late for you, and I got to get some lunch myself. So it's been great talking with you, though, uh, with, with you, DC. Um, we will look forward to connecting again. And if you haven't uh, checked out any of his books, please do on Amazon. They are awesome. I read them all. I can vouch for them. They are all very, very good books. I read these several years before I even started writing them. So mm -hmm. I will uh, talk with you later, my friend. Thanks, James. Take care of yourself. All right, bye. Cheers. Bye.